Good evening. I'm Shane Lavin of the Xavier Class of 2003 and Director of Annual Giving at Xavier. Thank you for joining us for the fourth event of Xavier's 175th anniversary lecture and conversation series. Tonight, we welcome Father Greg Boyle of the Society of Jesus, the founder of Homeboy Industries, the largest gang intervention, rehabilitation, and reentry program in the world, to this virtual conversation with Xavier's President Jack Roslowski. A native of Los Angeles, Father Greg Boyle entered the Society of Jesus in 1972 after graduating from Loyola High School, and he was ordained to the priesthood in 1984. He was pastor of Dolores Mission in the Boyle Heights neighborhood of Los Angeles from 1986 until 1992. There, Father Boyle saw the devastating impact of gang violence on his community. In 1988, he and parish and community members started what would eventually become Homeboy Industries. Homeboy employs and trains former gang members in a range of social enterprises and provides critical services to thousands of men and women every year who are seeking a better life. Father Boyle is the author of the 2010 New York Times bestseller, Tattoos on the Heart, The Power of Boundless Compassion, Barking to the Choir, The Power of Radical Kinship, and his latest book, The Whole Language, The Power of Extravagant Tenderness. If you're interested in reading any of these terrific books, please reach out to Ms. Susan Cardosa in the president's office. We have books available for the first 50 folks who contact Susan. Jack Roslowski is Xavier's 33rd president. Before his time at Xavier, Jack served as the superintendent of public schools in Hoboken, New Jersey, the provincial assistant for lay formation and education of the New York province Jesuits, and for many years in a variety of roles at St. Peter's Prep. Jack and his wife, uh, Sarah, have four children who have all had the blessing of a Jesuit education in schools and colleges across the country, including Xavier, Santa Clara, Georgetown, and even Regis. Thanks again for joining us. Now to Jack and Greg. Great, thanks so much, Shane, for the kind introductions. Greg, thanks so much for joining us as we celebrate Xavier's 175th anniversary this year. Uh, you, you, you've been most generous. As, as by our count, this is your fifth visit with us in the or your third visit with us in the last five years, and, uh, and 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 very grateful for your time here on 16th Street and your time tonight and your generosity with with so many works uh, and and your willingness to to visit and share the story. So thanks so much. Sure, happy to be with you. So. You know, we'll, we'll jump in to all those who, who, who've joined us. Um, we'll, we'll, be, we'll be together for about 45 minutes. And my hope is, uh, you know, I, I, I always go back to, to Andrew Greeley when, when he, uh, when speaking about Catholics and, uh, and people coming back and coming to church, uh, you know, we, Greeley said they come for the stories. And uh, in reading Greg's books, there are, there are great stories. And I'm grateful to, to him for sharing sharing his story and some of those stories with us tonight. So, you know, as a high school guy, I, I, I always always like starting with high school. So Loyola High School, 1972, what was your, what was your Jesuit high school experience like back then? Uh, and uh, how did that lead to entering the society? Oh, well, you know, I'm 50 years uh, a Jesuit and 50 years uh, graduate from Loyola High School in LA. In those days, you know, um, I, I, I couldn't tell you how many Jesuits, maybe there were 35, you know, and, and they were, they all, I always say the same thing, that they were hilarious, which I love, and they were um, prophetic, but their hilarity was really not, not frivolous. They were joyful. So you looked at them, you say, wow, I'll have what they're having. And powerful in, in the joy and uh, the contagion of it. And then, of course, at 72, so, um, you know, the Vietnam War, um, somebody from your neck of the woods, uh, Daniel Berrigan, was uh, really kind of a model for me. I, he, he was probably one of the reasons why I entered the Jesuits. When I was, uh, you know, at Loyola High, he was on the run, America's most wanted, the FBI was looking for him. So, and I, I remember a trial of the Catonsville Nine premiered at, in Los Angeles, I think. And uh, I remember seeing it and it just kind of changed the way I saw things. So 
I had an uncle who was a Jesuit, but I wouldn't say we were very close until I became a Jesuit because he was always in Rome or different places. And, uh, and I admired him a lot, but I didn't know him. So he wasn't kind of part of my equation, but the Jesuits were really just happy, joyful, fun. Uh, and they had a vision for uh, justice that, I, that appealed to me. Now, I, I can't imagine when you entered 50 years ago that you, um, if you looked ahead, that you'd see um, how you spent a lot of your life in the society, the gang work, the, the Dolores mission. How was that? Uh, what did you expect when you entered? And, and, and how did the journey, this journey unfold? Yeah, you know, even now, when you go into our headquarters, which is our fourth headquarters in Chinatown, Los Angeles, and people will kind of, it's really a teeming, bustling, packed with people even now. And, um, and folks kind of look at it and it's so immense. And they'll always say the same thing. How did you think this up? And I go, well, nobody really thinks this up. You know, you back your way into things, you evolve your way. So I, I never envisioned anything. And, I'm, and that's kind of not my style either to kind of envision something you respond that's kind of more my style so we need to remove tattoos okay well let's find a doctor who has a laser machine you know it wasn't you know you're responding to stuff that presents itself you know our, our next frontier is probably going to be um you know transitional housing and permanent housing and we're going to build it just because we're responding to the huge need especially for returning citizens who don't have a place to live. So homelessness is kind of 70% uh, of our people are homeless you know, under the kind of the federal guidelines that determine that. And so they're couch surfing or they're living in a car. And so we do the best we can, but now we want to actually build. So, you know, I, I don't envision that future. I'm just responding to the present. How how is the in your and I you know re referring to it as as work with gangs seems that the, the the language is not the right language or or, or 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 good language or the best language, but what are the changes right you, you, you know you look clearly there's the the impact on lives has been huge uh, the problem the gang problem still exists certainly I'm, I'm uh, what are, what are the changes? How have you affected them? What are you seeing? Um, what direction is that moving you and the work in? Yeah, well, you know, was, uh, working with gangs was born, uh, you know, 38 years ago for me, and Homeboy is 34 years old. So keep in mind that, you know, 88 to 98 was truly a decade of death and shootings all day long. And I was just burying kids one after another. So that was one thing that I was responding to. So married to that moment was also the first 10 years, starting in 88, of absolute demonizing of homeboy. So, you know, um, bomb threats, death threats, and hate mail. And so none of it from gang members, because we were always a symbol of hope for gang members, but, but folks who hated gang members, who demonized them, who it was a short hop to demonize me for helping them. <clears throat> so the friend of your enemy is our enemy. So, so it was a steady stream. Oddly, a lot of the anonymous letters or hate mail, if you will, were from law enforcement. You know, I'm a sheriff here in LA and I hate you. Uh, I'm an LAPD and you're part of the problem, not part of the solution. So if the demonizing is wholesale like that, you know, it's, it's an easy leap to demonize folks who are helping gang members. And then all that changed. You know, I, I'd say 15 years into our 34 years, people started to see, oh no, tough on crime is dumb on crime. And, and then they started to look at what Homeboy was doing and they go, Oh, this is kind of smart. So then things shifted. It really was a, a tipping point, I think, in Los Angeles anyway. Having said that, you know, we had 1992 was the highest 
a um, you know number of gang uh, homicides, gang homicides, was a thousand. Now, since then, every year, it's you know we've we've cut that number in half and then cut it in half again. Even though, you know, as we're coming out of the pandemic, and it's true every city, large and small, red state, blue state, everybody has seen a thirty percent increase in homicides. And I think there are a lot of reasons for that, and people speculate. But um, even so, we're I don't think we'll ever, thank God, ever get back to that hor horrific thousand gang-related homicides again. So, you know, it's um, over the long haul and it's incremental and it's the slow work of God. And you somehow, uh, if, if you're impatient in work like this, you're not gonna last very long. You know, a lot of, right here, here you are, a private, private work, and 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 I, you know, the in the ebb and flow of the political discourse over the years, right? Saying, well, there, there's things that, you know, government shouldn't be doing, or where where government's going to be ineffective, and we leave it to the private sector or the churches or the nonprofit world to do the type of work you're doing. Well, sort of the interplay of okay what you're doing has success and works, but the needs are much greater, right? The, you know, you're, you, you can't meet all the needs. What, how do you, how, how do we move that forward? How do you, how do you see moving that forward, right? What is the place of, of whether it's government programs, whether it's other nonprofits uh, to, with the needs being as great as they are, right? And, uh, what else? Yeah, I mean, I think you have to just do what you're doing, you know, because, you know, every time I give a talk somewhere, you know, sometimes there's always a, a person with some tone in their voice and they'll say, well, what are you doing to keep kids out of gangs? And I always say, nothing. What are you doing to keep kids out of gangs? You know, it's like, I don't want to say that we're not doing anything. I mean, we're breaking the cycle because gang members find homeboy a sanctuary then they become that sanctuary that they sought and then they go home to their kids and they present that sanctuary and you've broken a cycle but the point is everybody should all hands on deck roll up your sleeves find me somebody who, who can't be beneficial when it comes to every single vexing social dilemma that faces us from homeless to mental health issues to uh, urban gang violence. So, you know, you're always trying to uh, point the way. I mean, I think we settle for pointing things out. And Homeboy just tries to kind of point the way. You know, what if we knew that everybody is unshakably good? And what if we knew that everybody belongs, that we all belong to each other? And what if we all did our part to imagine a circle of compassion and then imagine nobody standing outside that circle? What if we all did what we could do? You know, but otherwise it's a kind of a, uh, a defeating notion that unless you can do everything, then you shouldn't do anything. Mm -hmm. And so, and Homeboy is, uh, is in the imagination business. You know, we, we, we're always trying to be the front porch of the house everyone wants to live in. So you're kind of, uh, you know, the Zen saying the finger pointing to the moon is not the moon, it points to the moon. So we're always trying to point to the moon, you know, where people look at it and go, oh, a community of kinship. Oh, so traumatized folks will probably cause trauma. Well, then cherished people are just as likely to find their way to the joy of cherishing themselves and others. So you're trying to point the way, not just point things out. And then people do what they can do. They, hey, I want to volunteer. I'm a doctor. Can I remove tattoos or whatever it is? Mm -hmm. So, so, I, I, and and I'm, 
often accused of not being the smartest or the sharpest tack in the draw. Uh, as, as I was looking at, and, and I'm going to segue to this book, looking at, at, at your books, right, and, and sort of saying, well, you know, boundless compassion, radical kinship, extravagant tenderness. You know, I, it, it occurred to me, I've been seeing these as, as stories of the work, right, when, when, when really what they are, and I, I think if I was again a little sharp attack, or uh, I would have recognized this at the beginning that they that they really are theological works, right? They're uh, in 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 their own ways accessible theological works about the nature of God. And in in, in the most recent book, right, you, you begin there with with people's notion of God, right, and how that that shapes shapes things. Can you speak to that for those the, those who haven't read it? Because I I. I you know, right on one level, it should be so obvious to us as as Christians, uh, and on an another level of things that should be obvious maybe aren't. So, speak to that notion of God and how that shapes things and shapes the work. And, and yeah, yeah, I think that there's nothing more consequential than that. And you know, Richard Rohr, the theologian, says, "Yeah, it's true that we're all created in the image and likeness of God, but it's also true that our image of God creates us." And I think that's absolutely true. And I think you can only point to everything. You know, people who are, uh, who believe in a God who's spacious and merciful and expansive and inclusive, well, that's how they are in the world. I mean, there's not much you can do about it. If your God is puny and judgmental, brace yourself. You're going to be puny and judgmental. There's just, there's kind of no way around that, which is why it's, the most consequential thing to to refine the notion of who your god is uh, my friend uh, mirabai star who's a, a mystic and she writes about mystics and she translates you know john of the cross and such and she says once you know the god of love you fire all the other gods and that's kind of the the adult maturing task is to fire all the other gods but we get stuck in our third grade God. And, and then we're surprised, you know, that's why people kind of go, I stopped believing in God because I asked him to do this and he didn't do it. And you go, wow, graduate from the third grade. That's, that's a little kid stuff. I mean, seriously, with all due respect. And so you want people to, to like Ignatius of Loyola always talks about the God who's always greater. And, uh, you know, today's gospel is about be merciful as God is. And, and merciful is just kind of a huge, spacious concept. It, it's about standing in awe at what the poor have to carry rather than in judgment at how they carry it. I, I just came back from uh, Tacoma uh, speaking at our high school up there, Bellarmine. And there was a, a homie named Jose, who I'd never heard him speak before. And he hasn't been with us very long, maybe six months. And, you know, he, he uh, his first memory, I mean, he's 37 years old. 20 years of those 37 were behind bars one way or the other. And he got up and his first memory was as, as a five-year-old boy trying to get in between his mother and father who were uh, fighting. And the father was beating down the mother. And, and the father would knock him over, but he'd still get up and stand in between them, five years old. Finally, the father was so annoyed, he went into the kitchen, and there was a huge uh, pot of boiling frijoles. And, and he goes and he dumps this on his son. And the whole gym just gasped. And he said, all my skin came off, he said. And he said, I didn't go to the hospital because my father says, in this house, nobody snitches. So at 10, he, he gets arrested for selling drugs for his father. And when he gets out, he's 11. And he says, I don't want to sell drugs anymore. And the father threw him out of the house for refusing to bring money into the house. I mean, extraordinary and and the students were so it was such a compelling story you know he got into a gang and etc and then he said i 
I'm grateful to my father because he taught me how not to be one. And, and he talked about how he cherished his boys and he tells them how much he loves them. And he plays with them. And he talked about how foreign um, hide and seek was. It, when one of his kids said, hey, let's play hide and seek. He goes, why are we hiding and what are we seeking? He had never heard of this before because he was never a child and never had a childhood anyway. So you, now, you know, the God of judgment and, and coloring inside the lines and even the God of right and wrong and good and bad. No, this is the God of mercy who looks at this kid and, and, and then suddenly your heart is broken by the very thing that breaks the heart of God. So nothing more consequential. And, and it's really an urgent thing. I don't think the church has been very helpful there because, you know, the church has kind of always liked the God that kept you in line, but that's not the God of love. You know, my friend Annie Lamott always says, you know, you've created God in your own image when God hates the same people as you do. And, <laughs> and, and that's exactly how it is. And, and, and I think it's urgent that we change that. So how do we, right, I, I would agree. The, uh, and then uh, like how do we begin to crack that nut, right, of uh, people, people are attached to their, right, to their third grade gods, you know? And I'm, by, 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 I'm not pointing at others, right? I have my own attachments that I, you know, I need to honestly face. But the, because what, you know, one one place I want to I, I want to go uh, sort of next in, in in the conversation is when we look when we look at the, the 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 state of American society today with all its complications and its divisiveness and um, you know and as 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 we've just started this Lenten journey you know and I, I keep listening to the gospel each day and I'm saying you know here's the answer right each day we're given an answer and uh, but how many of us are listening? How many of us are listening well enough? Uh, uh, how many of us are embodying that? So I'm off. I'm off on a tangent and a ramble, which I, which you might appreciate, but I, 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 I'm sure our audience does not. So let me go back to the original piece of the puzzle and then get to the second piece. So how do how do we help each other expand that that notion of God? in all God's goodness and his God's dreams and desires for us. Well, I think, you know, you started by talking about stories, you know, and, and I think, I think it's important to tell stories because, you know, um, I think what we're invited to is a kind of a mystical consciousness. And um, Ignatius used a word, acatamiento, and it means it's an archaic word, but on February 27th, 1544, Ignatius used that word for the first time. And then he, in his spiritual journal, then he used it a lot until he died 12 years later. He even went back and he had circled the word. And it, it comes from the word to look at something with attention. It gets translated, acatamiento, as affectionate awe. So it's not, so Ignatius came from a mystical moment individual personal private but then it it turned into consciousness it turned into a stance and that's important to move from the moment to the stance how do i stand in the world how do i be in the world who god is merciful compassionate loving and kind and then all of a sudden and ignatius did this and, and you feel like it's it it was born of his practice. It's what he worked at. It was acatamiento, where he was always standing with affectionate awe and receiving people. Like the other day, and Jack, you'll appreciate this, but um, I, a homie came up to me I hadn't seen in a long time. His name is Johnny, and he gave me a big hug in front of the headquarters. And he, he was kind of sizing me up, and he says, 
um, you look different, he said to me. And I said, well, you know, I've lost 30 pounds. And he says, wow, I didn't know hair weighed that much. <laughs> <laughs> and I died laughing. But this is a kid who has suffered so much. And if his story had been a flame, you'd have to keep your distance, otherwise you get scorched. And so it's exquisitely mutual. You're, it's um, relational wholeness. It's delighting in the person in front of you because we don't have any other moment except this current one, this present one. And then you delight. And it's not for nothing that in the Old Testament, you know, God's nickname for God's people is my delight. And that's not just a one-way street. That's, that's the tender glance we receive. And then we, we are that in the world. And following Jesus isn't some grim duty. It's delight. It's where the joy is. And that's, that's the best kept secret of the gospel. It, it isn't about sacrifice or suffering. It's about my joy, yours, as Jesus says and your joy complete. Mm -hmm. We've missed that because we, you know, even during Lent, you know, it's, uh, I find that really tough, you know, because it's, I don't know, all the prayers are about sin and stuff like that. I don't know. I don't think Jesus agrees with that stuff. Mm -hmm. He's inviting you to wholeness, sure. not, not, you know, please beat yourself up for 40 days. Uh, uh, I had a homegirl named Michelle who came in to see me and, and she said, it's official. I said, what? And she goes, I just found out that my man's been cheating on me. And I said, oh, I'm sorry. She goes, ah, I don't sweat it. I, I just went to church. I got me them ashes, gave his ass up for Lent. <laughs> it, it's my favorite Lenten story. But, <laughs> But it's not about giving stuff up. It's about giving into the God who loves us without measure and without regret. The God who invites us to joy. Uh, I mean, the, the first reading for Sunday was, you know, count. God says to Abraham, count the stars if you can, which is to say you can't. Mm -hmm. and, and that's the Ignatian, the God who's always greater. Sure. And, and Ignatius saying, take care to keep always before your eyes first God, because this is the God who's large mm. and expansive and spacious and, and, and count the stars if you can. You really can't. That's how large this is. So it's, it's an invitation to, uh, to find our true selves in loving, and, and nothing is more joyful than that. Thank you. Thank you. The, the, right, the gift of being free enough to sort of to see that, right, and, and to enter, enter into that. And how do we invite people into freedom? So, so I'm going to, I'm, I'm, I'm dragging you in a little bit into my world here, right? Because, um, you know, I, I, I spend a lot of time these days, not a day goes by that I am not in discussions uh related to race or people's perceptions of critical race theory or all various machinations of that um and 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 often this is these are concerns among alums or uh or but then again occasionally parents um and 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 i know when you when you were writing the whole language right the you know it was shaped by covid and uh you, you began as a sort of some uh, you're writing during covid uh at least if i remember correctly and and in the aftermath of sort of the national reckoning on on race after the death of you know Ahmaud Arbery and Breonna Taylor and George Floyd and others so and, in a lot of ways, right, I, from, from where I sit, there, there's 
been more and more divisiveness around issues of race and uh, and other race first and foremost, and certainly uh, uh, other issues, right? Everything becomes a battle. And, um, you know, from your perspective, right, of the work you've done, we've seen, what do you make of this, right? The, 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 the divisiveness, the, the way, in many ways, people are re-entrenching on race issues and, and other things. Any, any thoughts? I want you to solve my problems. Yeah, sure. I, I you know, I, I hear you. And, and part of the thing is, you know, wherever you're going to start is where you're going to end up. So if your starting point is how do we divide and how do we, you know, who's, who belongs to us and who doesn't, if your starting point, point is us and them, then you're going to end up there. But, you know, Mother Teresa says the problem in the world is that we've forgotten that we belong to each other. So if part of your starting point is that we belong to each other and there's nobody, nobody excluded from that. And so our task is to dismantle the barriers that exclude. The other starting point is everybody's unshakably good. No exceptions. There are no exceptions to that everybody is unshakably good. Now, a lot of people don't know that. A lot of people can't see that. A lot of people uh, are kind of blind or mentally ill. You know, um, I had a Jesuit friend because I always say everybody's included in the circle of uh, compassion. And he wrote me and he says, you still think Putin is in the circle of inclusion? And I just said, nobody healthy or whole or well invades the you, you invades Ukraine. So part of the problem is our starting point is we've settled for moral outrage. And we think the more we can shake our fist and scream and say that was really horrific, we think that's moral compass. And it isn't. And, and that's just pointing something out and not pointing the way. So when a man attacks an aged Asian woman on the streets of San Francisco, it's horrific. And we say Asian hate crime, but we don't get underneath anything. And all it does is demonize and, and says two untruthful things. This guy doesn't belong to us. And this guy is bad. Neither of those are true. And neither uh, uh, is anything that God would ever co-sign on, not the God we actually have. The God some folks have settled for may agree with that, but not the God of love, not the God we actually have. So nobody healthy in the history of the world has ever attacked an aged Asian woman on the streets of anywhere. It's never happened. And once you know that, you go, well, then how do we love each other into wholeness? How do we help people? Gang members have taught me that, you know, because I've never met a bad person. And I, and I know more gang members than any human being on the planet. Mm -hmm. And I, I've never met a bad person. I've met despondent people. I've met traumatized people. I've, I've met severely injured people. I've met mentally ill people, but I've never met a bad person, and never. And, and the homies always talk about find the thorn underneath. And everything that plagues us is about something else. So Matthew Dowd, a writer, says, uh, you know, one third of the American people, he believes, he thinks that this is true, that one third of the American people do not believe that all men and women are created equal. I think he's right. Now what? What's that mean? You know, what's it point to? What's the thorn underneath? Especially if everyone belongs to us, including that one third of the country. Well, it just means we're, we're not well, we're not whole, we're not healthy. And I don't need to demonize anybody to make that assertion. 
And none of us are well until all of us are well. And, and that's kind of a key thing, it seems to me, because it refuses to demonize, which is always the opposite of the truth and always the opposite of how God sees. If that's your starting point, then you'll end in a good place, in a healthy place, in a place that wants to restore and repair severed belonging. Otherwise, you, you just want to keep creating camps. Count me out. And that comes because we've, we've mistaken moral outrage for moral compass. So if I can scream loud enough at something, then that, I don't know what, it proves that I'm a moral person. No, it just proves that you don't have a volume control. I mean, you, you really do want to get underneath and begin in the right place. So it takes you to a place of healing and restoration and repair. That's what, that's what we need. Thank you. I don't think that's that helpful for you, but it, you know. Well, it, 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 listen, it, it's part, I think part of the challenge, right, is, is, is how do we speak about this and how to, um, how do we speak about this with one another and how in gentle ways can we challenge and be hopeful and and anchored and and, and joyful it, it it for me personally it gets exhausting at times but well let me segue there because I, I i have two sort of final final pieces there one you know i i, I gotta admit for me sometimes in these and and this is more so lately with with the the issue, you know, the issues of the world, and maybe this is a good thing and the right thing, but get, but you know, I find they're getting sort of hoisted upon or, or or thrown upon institutions, right? So any you know worries about whether it's society at large, whether it's race, whether it's the political system, right? That in some sense are out there become and are not really sort of Xavier's issues or Loyola LA or Bellarmine Tacoma you know, become our issues, right? Pe people bring them to the table. And it, and, and it can be exhausting, right? Uh, now, how do, you, how, do, how do you you personally deal with those moments? Maybe maybe you don't have them, but those moments of exhaustion or uh, how do you, in some sense, how do you keep going, right? How do you keep going, uh, particularly in the rough spots, the difficult spots, the disappointments? What? Yeah, I don't, I don't do disappointment. I don't do discouragement. I've just decided not to. And part of that comes from just, um, if you're anchored in the present moment, then it's eternally replenishing and you're never depleted. It just works that way. Then you're delighting in whoever's in front of you. And, and you're not lamenting what happened yesterday and you're not anxious about tomorrow, anchored in the present moment. And now that's our practice. You have to work at that. And you have to choose to cherish people with every breath you take. So systems change when people change. And people change when they're cherished. And everybody needs a safe place in the community. Everybody needs to be seen. So how do folks you know, feel less invisible? And everybody needs to be cherished. And, and so that's the, the aerial view. And then, then you need to take serious, Christians anyway, need to take seriously what Jesus took seriously. And there are only four things, you know, inclusion, nonviolence, unconditional loving kindness, and compassionate acceptance. They're big things, but they're only four. And imagine if, if you could stay close to the marrow of the gospel, as St. Francis used to say. Stay close to the marrow of the gospel, which are, are those four things. Then you're freed. And then it's never about fear-based anything. And, and then you start to say, yeah, nobody healthy has ever been an anti-Semite. Nobody whole has ever been a racist. Nobody well has ever been a homophobe. That's never happened. 
And the problem comes if we think everybody is rational and coming from a healthy place, well, that's a bad diagnosis. And if you, know, if you look at our, our country at the moment, the crisis really is a mental health one. It, and you know, from, from January 6th to um, you know, people acting out on planes and being disruptive to anti-vaxxers and all that stuff is, it's a measure of health. It's a health crisis. It's not a moral crisis. I mean, morality has never kept us moral. It's just kept us from each other. So how do we, how do we get to a place where we're tender with each other and we cherish each other and that's all we do? because it's all you can do. And, and I'm not suggesting that this is easy, but it is clear. It's what Jesus did. It is who our God is. And now we need to roll up our sleeves and choose to be that in the world. But I wish it was a once and for all, or even after my prayer this morning, I'm good for the day. No, you work at it. It is your practice. It is every breath you take needs to be a cherishing breath. And do I think that that will work? Yeah, I mean, the truth is not everything that works helps, but everything that helps works. So find the thing that helps. Find the thing that's most loving. You know, catch yourself when you're excluding or you're drawing the lines and Jesus erased the lines. You don't need to draw them. And, and the church is an expert, unfortunately, at circling the wagons and being defensive and, and fearful. And we're not supposed to circle the wagons. We're supposed to widen the circle. And the more it's wider, the more it greatly resembles what Jesus had in mind. You know, it's, it's a tall order, but it's a constant consciousness. For, for Ignatius, you know, he had that kind of merciful consciousness. It was mystical. It had real impact on how he lived his life finally, you know, with affectionate awe for everybody. And... And he was just couldn't have been more filled with joy once he got through all the, you know, the crazy stuff in his early years, you know, the deprivation stuff and the scruples. And, and he had to graduate from the third grade God. Uh, and then, you know, yeah, his, his image of God created him ultimately. And, and he couldn't contain himself. He was just filled with utter complete joy um and and that's kind of what we're invited to Ed, if i was looking for a place to close i think that's a good uh a good place to close the um the friend uh friend tom smith the uh, jesuit here who we were was on the provincial staff with and uh Really, Tom, Tom, one of the great men of the New York province or the old New York province, but would, you know, always had, always had the reminder as he would leave me, uh, keep the faith and the joy that goes with it. And he, he was one of the few people uh, who was uh, wise enough to always talk about the joy. And, uh, and I appreciate you, uh, you sharing that with us today. So, Greg, thanks so much for, uh, for helping us celebrate the 175th. Thanks for, uh, thanks for joining us once again. And, and really thanks for your, uh, your witness to all, uh, all this goodness and, and, and your invitation through that witness to, uh, to love better and to love more fully. I'm grateful for that. Thank you, Jack, a pleasure being with you. You're good having you. Thanks to all who joined us and uh, we look forward to seeing you in person before long and to seeing you at future conversations and lectures in our 175th anniversary series. My thanks to Hernando Avila, our Director of Technology,
Ms. Shauna Gallagher-Vega, our Director of Communications, Mr. Shane Lavin and Ms. Susan Cardosa, all who helped make our time together possible. Thanks to the Homeboy Industry staff for coordinating things at Greg's End. And for those who would like a copy of Greg's book, please reach out to Ms. Cardosa in my office tomorrow. Thank you. This is Jack Roslowski at Xavier saying good night and stealing from my friend Tom Smith, keep the faith and the joy that goes with it. <laughs>